Major Jim Maton, United States Air Force, Vietnam. Jim served in Vietnam from 1968 to 69. He was an F-100 fighter bomber pilot. That's the first and the last story I had of a fighter bomber pilot in Vietnam. Such a great story. He talks about napalm, what that is, was. He would release those canisters. And he talks about Agent Orange, which a lot of our veterans have suffered from over the years. So this is a great story. I invite you to bring the whole family in and watch this. This is a very educational, historical value here, folks. Uh, I met Jim in Petersburg, Virginia. It was February of 2007. And I interviewed about a dozen veterans that week while I was there. And this is a great story. Like I said, it's been sitting in my archives and I'm just really happy to share it with you today. Jim flew mainly close air support missions in Vietnam and just tells a great story, great perspective of Vietnam. I wanna thank Don Larson for making it possible for you to listen to this story today with Jim Maton. Don, thank you for your support of my work, for your support of our veterans and our country, and I just appreciate you and hope we can work together soon. God bless you. Okay, folks, I'm wearing this sh shirt today. Do you see what the shirt says? Grateful to our Vietnam veterans. Um, a viewer of mine who sponsored one of my stories, Jim Baker, he makes these shirts. And um, I just want to thank Jim for that again. And I'll show you the back. I told him you needed to put this on the back. And that's what we need to tell our Vietnam vets is, is welcome home. So anyways, I thank you for watching today. If you want to support this work in any shape, form, or manner, you can sponsor a veteran like Don has with this story. There's information, there's actually a link in the video description. You click on the link. The video description is the information below the video. I know a lot of you click play, you watch the video, but below the video, there's a video description. And in there is a link. You click on it, you see pictures of my veterans, and I would invite you to, uh, to sponsor a story. Uh, just give me the name of the veteran and I'll do the rest. In the comment section of every video on YouTube has comments. So the, the first comment is always mine. And in that section is a link to donate to my work. So I would just take a moment to, to walk you through that again. If you would like to just donate to my work, I'd greatly appreciate it. Or my radio station, Voices of History Radio. It would be greatly, greatly appreciated. By the way, Voices of History Radio is now heard in over 40 countries in this world. Ah, I just touched my heart. There's people day and night now listening all around the world. And just it's just wonderful. These stories, Jim Maton's story will be on Voices of History Radio after it airs here. So just I have about 200 stories up there now. And they're rotating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I just invite you to listen to the station, download the apps for free. Share it with a young person. Living history in the palm of their hands. It doesn't get any better than that. As they go through this next school year and learn history, give this to the history teachers. My goodness, give it to them. They need to hear these stories. Amen. Okay, folks, that's it for now. Thank you for listening and sharing these stories, subscribing to this channel, and I hope to talk to you soon. By the way, I'm producing YouTube Shorts. I, I, I got into the YouTube Short thing. I'm, I'm trying it. It's working really good. I've had thousands of views, just 60-second clips from some of my stories. You go to my video channel, Voices of History, and you click on the Shorts link because these shorts are not being you're not being notified as a subscriber I don't know why YouTube does it like that if you are I'd like to know but uh, but I've got an audience out there watching these shorts and I'm trying to lead them to the main uh, YouTube channel so thank you for taking the time to listen to this message and it's a little longer than usual but I hope it's worth it to you so God bless you and I'll talk to you soon Vietnam. What year did you serve in Vietnam? July 68 to July 69. Okay. And how old were you at that time? <sighs> Help me with the math here. Uh, 
was see, 36, born in 32, 36, and then 39, or 37 when, 69 when I came now, home. how old are you now? I'll be 75 next okay. month. Okay, and did you go to basic training somewhere? Or actually, were you enlisted? Did you enlist? Or? No, I went through the aviation cadet program back okay. in the 50s. Okay. Uh, okay. 13 months of training, flying, and uh, he graduated with wings and a second lieutenant commission. Let's just get uh, just a general historical question I like to ask some of the veterans. Just give me a little bit about Vietnam and why we were involved as a country, the best that you can remember as far as, you know. Well, we were trying to keep the communists from taking over the world. And that was one of the reasons that we went over there, to help the people out. They wanted to be free. But after you got there, you found out that uh, I don't think they really wanted to be free. A bunch of them. A lot of graft, and, and you know, you didn't, you, you couldn't trust people. It's like uh, Iraq now, I guess. You could, uh, the maid come in and clean your quarters out during the day, and uh, at night she had on black pajamas and a, a gun in her hand. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it was over there that uh, the, the Vietnamese, that was the barber, that a lot of guys would go, and when they get their hair cut, they'd have the 38 in their hand, or laying in their lap, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I never carried mine in there, but it, it was always in your mind, you know. So, now you went in, you were as a fighter pilot. What did, what did you fly? Tell me what you flew. I flew F-100 fighter bombers, a single seat. Mm -hmm. It uh, had uh, four 20 millimeter, millimeter cannons in the nose. It carried, uh, it had four stations under the wing that they carried bombs, rockets, napalm, so forth and had two drop, external drop tanks that uh, had about uh, 275 gallons each in them. Uh, later on, uh, before they all came home, they put uh, mirror racks on them, multiple ejector racks, and they could carry more than the four bombs. They put uh, maybe four bombs on, on the inboard pylons, which were the strongest of the wing, and you, it'd give you more bombs to carry. Now, when you went to Vietnam, was it, say, 67? 68. Was this your first time in country when you arrived there at that time? Where you yeah. ever been to Vietnam? That was my first time. The Air Force had a policy back then, the Air Force Chief of Staff did, that nobody would go back non-volunteer the second time until everybody had gone. I mean, you could volunteer to stay to extend your tour if you wanted to, but uh, they wouldn't send you back a non-volunteer unless you were a critical need for you, for what you did. But he said nobody would go back twice until everybody went. So what do you remember about your first time in country? Describe what you felt, what you saw, what you smelled when you first got off a plane or whatever you did. When I left San Francisco, it was one of those murky days. You, know, you feel, you get sweaty, you know, and you feel like uh, you'd like to get a shower, but I figured right then I made up my mind. I said, this is the way it's going to be for another year until you get back home. And uh, just about that's where it was. It was, uh, you got over there, it was hot, sweaty. I was at a good base, uh, real, uh, we were right on the coast, halfway up the, uh, Vietnam, it was called, a place called Tuiwa, and uh, my quarters was right across the road from the beach, so when I wasn't flying, I could uh, go across and sit on the beach, suntan and so forth, and didn't get in the water too much because when I first got there, they had, the beach was off limits for swimming. Uh, the sewage problem had uh, messed up, and uh, also uh, just before I got there, they had an aircraft take off with uh, canisters of uh, uh, CBUs, which was a cluster bomb unit, and he had engine problems, and he dropped four cans of those in the, in the ocean right off the beach, and those things had a 30-day time limit. In other words, after 30 days, it was sort of self-destruct. So they didn't want anybody to get in the water with these things floating around there or bobbing up and down on the floor. So that, that was another reason that the beach was closed. But it was, it was a nice, nice place except for the five minutes every day you were over target and that joker down there was trying to kill you. So. so what kind of missions did you fly and where? We flew close air support mainly with the troops in the south. Uh, at that time the F-100 was not going north uh, because it, it didn't go fast enough didn't carry enough bombs. When the, they first started over there, the 100 did go north. It was the first, uh, what they called a wild weasel. It went in with the strike fighters 
to sort of screw up the enemy radar on the SAM sites. But then uh, they, the F-105 took its place later on down the line. But so the, all the 100s worked in country. We did go into Laos. We had missions into Laos. At the time, uh, they said you weren't supposed to, we weren't supposed to be in Laos, so we weren't in Laos, and they called it the Western DMZ. DMZ. And we bombed, we had missions fragged by the wing daily to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But in country was strictly uh, support the troops, close air support. We flew two ship flights. Uh, usually the missions were fragged or scheduled a day or two in advance. And when you took off, you had a point to go to and a forward air controller to contact. And he would direct you into his target that he had. Uh, you couldn't, it wasn't like World War II where you went in and you dropped bombs on anything you saw moving. Over there, they had to approve, the South Korean, uh, South Vietnamese had to approve the strikes, and then the fact would put you in where they wanted you to go, where they would, they would clear you to go into. What was the most difficult part of what you had to do in Vietnam? Uh, uh, I guess the, the hairiest mission, or the most difficult missions that I think that we had were the ones that we went up into Laos on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This was during uh, 1968 when Johnson had the bombing halt, declared a bombing halt on the north. And, and when they did that, they moved all the big guns and so forth down into Laos. And they didn't move the, sand, the missiles down there, but they moved the guns. And you could, on just about every mission, you could see flak that they were shooting at you. And we had the mission up there of laying down or, or dropping the CBUs, which I was telling you about, the little bomb units. They had to be delivered about 300 feet off the ground, off the deck, and getting down in the trees and, you know, down in amongst them there. I had some people, I never saw it, but some of the guys that went up there that delivered that stuff said that they would fly down through the valleys and you could look up and you could see the guys up there in the, in the foxholes and so forth. Sometimes they wouldn't shoot, sometimes they would. But a lot of times up there, uh, they didn't want to shoot at you because if they shot at you, they get more people in on them, especially the facts. When the fact forward air controller would go in, uh, he'd sort of, he had an area that he flew over every day, and he could tell when sort of when the tree was moved, and he knew you know something was missing there and there, and he would fly around, and they would used to shoot at him earlier, but then they found out when they started shooting at him, he'd get fighters in there, so they try to keep quiet, and they wouldn't shoot until you know unless they were spotted, then they would start shooting at you. So now what are your targets? Are you just close air support? Is that close air support would be the troops trying to attack American troops. Up on uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos, we were looking for trucks, truck parks, where they would bring them down and uh, they'd travel at night and then they'd park them during the day and they'd try to pick them up in the daytime and then try to destroy them that way or bomb the road. Uh, and you, you did a lot of that. You see the bomb craters and everything. Were there troops, enemy troops, down there at times when you were firing on them, or? Normally they were. Uh, the, the forward air controller would, uh, you know, say put them in here, and we've got, we've been, troops have been sighted, or this post, this outpost is being attacked, and you know they want you to put your bombs so many meters away from the fence line in this area, and we're just helping them out. One of the missions I, uh, I went on. Uh, we were, uh, after we had uh, sort of dropped our bombs, we were diverted or called in by the fact and wanted to know if we had any uh, ammunition, uh, 20 millimeters left. There were two, there was a, a company of, of army troops, I guess, uh, it was in two circles where they had their uh, half tracks or whatever, their armored personnel carriers, and sort of a semicircle. And they had, the enemy was in, sort of in between of them. And they wanted to know if we could strafe there and through the middle for them. And uh, they would get taken pretty heavy fire on both, both sides. So we did, uh, and uh, in the process, we, we, we used all our ammunition up, but we were low on fuel, and we had to divert to the closest base there, which was right around uh, Saigon, Benoit. But that was one of the most rewarding, I guess, missions, because we helped these guys out a lot. So an airstrike, would you be called in for what's called an airstrike of the infantry needs? Yeah, so most, of, most of the time it was. We kept. There were, I forget how many, but there were always 
uh, probably four birds uh, uh, on alert, strip alert, that uh, were armed up, cockpit was set, and you supposedly had to get, be airborne in 15 minutes if somebody really needed help right now. And uh, everybody pulled alert uh, at least 12 hours or 24 hours a day uh, until you had three missions. If you had three missions, uh, wing policy, you came off and somebody replaced you. But normally you'd only get maybe one or two. And that was strictly for the emergency. When some, uh, they had a, a lot of the emergencies was, were uh, long range patrols that were up in the Laos and the Cambodian border area. If they would get in trouble up there, then they would scramble you up to help pull them out. And I was just going through my diary the other night, just reading some of the missions that I went on. And uh, one of them, I had made a note in there that uh, we were about the sixth or seventh flight that had been called in on this particular target trying to get these guys out of there. So, um, is there such a cold word as broken arrow? Broken arrow was strictly nuke weapons, and that was in the, mainly in the states. That was if if there was an accident with uh, with nuke weapons, like if a, the bomber accidentally dropped one, or it was a mid-air collision and it had weapons on board, they would call a broken arrow. Was there ever a situation where the infantry was being overrun by the enemy, and you were called out, or was it? No, we never were called out uh, situations like that that we dropped on our own people, you know, where they were mixed up. No. The, I guess the Army and the helicopters and so forth were, were called in to do something like that occasionally. And uh, the slow-moving airplanes, the, uh, the A-1s, which were the propeller-driven, they carried more bombs, more rockets, they could stay over target longer. And they were used uh, a lot of times for a little close in than we could provide. And also, they were the ones that went in with the, uh, the Jolly Green Giants, the uh, rescue helicopters, to pick up their pilots or pick up the uh, these long-range patrols and so forth. Where does Napalm or Agent Orange fit into all this? We never dropped Agent Orange. We flew top cover for the C-123s that were dispensing it. Uh, we have a flight of two or four that would weave back and forth over the, the 123s as they went down to spray. And if they took ground fire, they would throw out a flare or what they called a log. It was a, a smoke, smoke rocket or smoke log. And then we would, after they passed over, we would go in and work the area over. But napalm, we carried napalm quite a bit. Uh, there again, that had to be dropped at low altitudes. Uh, we carried both kinds, so a thin kind, when you had a little bit of better trajectory with it, you could sort of drop it like a bomb. But the unfin kind, when you dropped it, they would just tumble. And that was, that was released down uh, at least, uh, the closer to the ground you were, the better spread uh, effect you got out of it. Can you tell me, in layman's terms, so people understand, what is napalm, what it was used for, and how effective it was? In the napalm scene? was jelly gasoline, and it just, as a, the interview on a tape I had that the guy, the squad I made over there, it, it just burns. The devil out of you and sucks the air right out of your lungs. So it, it's a pretty potent weapon. This was used against, obviously, the North Vietnamese? Yes. Or? Yeah, well, the VC, the North, whatever that was in there attacking the, uh, the units. It, uh, it would clear out an area, it would burn an area. And it's, if you were in it, I mean, I don't think you'd ever get out of it if you were in, a, in the, the, the big main part of it when it splashed. So it's, it's like a flamethrower? Yeah. That's the same stuff that's in the flamethrower, the jelly gasoline. And then what's Agent Orange now? Agent Orange was what they, I guess it's sort of like uh, uh, Roundup. It kills the vegetation. And that's what they were trying to do, strip the vegetation down so they'd have clear, clear fire areas and they could see if the VC would come in at the post and everything. So that wasn't designed to drop on top of people? No. What's this? I, again, this a lot. Of this is hearsay, but you hear people talk about suffering from Agent Orange, or because the troops were in and around that, and, or went in afterwards, or what's all. Well, that? yeah, that's my uh, the interpretation of it. That the guys that flew it and dropped it from the 123s, of course, that spray and all got in the in the cockpit and all of. They got it all over them when they filled up the tanks, and I don't think back then there were real concern about the effects of it long down, down range because they, they probably didn't wear masks or things like that. And they got it on their clothes and they didn't you know, clean, change clothes quick enough or often enough to get rid of it. 
And once you dropped it on the ground, if the troops went through it, of course it's in the ground, it's dust, you breathe it. And there again, I don't think they knew the long range consequences of it when they dropped it. But it, was, it served a purpose, I guess, because it defoliated the trees and everything there. So, that so it did, now again, the napalm, I mean, is that at your discretion you would use that, or how was that? No, that was, that was fragged. That was, okay. All missions were fragged for a, speci for a specific target, and they put whatever they wanted to on the bombs for that mission, whether they wanted bombs, they wanted rockets, or they wanted napalm. Um, was there a weapon of choice for you? I mean, as far as, I mean, does it matter to you what you use to just... No, I made up my mind when I went over there, I was going to try to get good from way out. So when I dropped my bombs, I was high up and they couldn't shoot me. <laughs> what was, it? was there any anti-aircraft and fire? I mean, like yeah, well, up, in, up in Laos it was. And always down south, if you got too low, they had uh, 50 cal machine guns, which would knock you down. And it was always that one golden BB that, that if I just fired a, a rifle up in there and you hit the bullet, it could, um, you know, get in your engine and uh, cause your engine problems, engine failure. Did you lose anybody around you on any remissions or people that you knew that didn't make it back? Or? Uh, I never lost anybody on my flights or my missions. Uh, in the wing, we lost some people. <clears throat> in fact, my roommate for a while, uh, I had an extra bed in my, my uh, quarters. Uh, I was a flight commander at the time, and usually they had a single bed or a single room. But I had an extra bed at the time, and this new kid came in as a lieutenant. And once he got qualified as flight lead, he was uh, coming back off of a mission. And the weather was a little, wasn't real clear. It was a little uh, hazy, a bit messy, I guess. And as he was letting down, uh, his wingman just peeled off and went into the ocean. And, but other than that, uh, close in that squadron, I didn't lose uh, anybody that was close. I had a close buddy that had a midair with a VAC up in Laos, and they both got out and were rescued. And strange thing, maybe if you got time, there's a little uh, story behind that. Uh, I came back here uh, after I retired, and we had a dog, a little Dotson, we took to the vet one night. And this, uh, vet was talking to me about uh, where what I did and, and, and uh, I told him I was in Vietnam. He said, well, I had a brother who was over there. Mm. And uh, he said he was a Ford Air Controller and he was involved in a mid-air up in Laos with an F-100. And I said, well, the F-100 driver was a close friend of mine and when they invited your brother down for uh, the investigation and so forth, I was TDY and he stayed in my hooch, my quarters. Mm. So it was just a coincidence there. Wow. Yeah. But I did lose some close friends in other squadrons, and other flights. I wear a POWMI bracelet. I have two of them. I wear one one day and one the next. One of them is a classmate. We were good friends. We instructed together for quite a while. Uh, and when we first got our commission, he went down, <clears throat> he went down on an RF-4 night photo mission coming out of North Vietnam. He was shot down in the southern part of North Vietnam, what they call Route Pack 1. Uh, no shoot, no beeper, nobody heard from him, so they don't know exactly what happened. The other guy is, was a real close friend. He was in two squadrons with me. He was my assistant flight commander in both squadrons. Uh, we flew together quite a lot on each other's wing in the same airplane, drank a mini Jim Bean and seven up together. And uh, <clears throat> his... Uh, wife and kids and so forth are real close. My kids call him Uncle Russ and Aunt Joe, and uh, his boy called me Uncle Jimmy and Aunt Jean and so forth. He went down on a low-level mission, night mission in, uh, in Laos. He was laying high drag bombs, which is the bombs you lay when you drop them. They got fins to slow the bomb down so that you can get out from the bomb blast. And some, pardon the language, but idiot, and so when the Air Force says, we need to lay these things down at night. You can get you know, better control, put them on the road. Well, he flew into the side of a mountain over in Laos at night at 300 feet when you drop the bombs. So pretty soon after that, they stopped dropping them a little level because they were losing too many people. They lost two or three like that. So you're the flight commander. So are you at the front <coughs> of the formation or how many? Uh, 
aircraft are in, <clears throat> in, a, in a, that mission? Well, in flight, flight command I was talking about was in charge of seven or eight guys in the squadron. The flight leader is in the flight. And once you were flight quad lead qualified, you were usually, you'd go up, with, in South Vietnam we had two missions, two, I mean two ship flights. When you went out of country into Laos, we went as a four ship flight. You carry more bombs, you get more stuff on the target. And uh, we hit the tanker when it went to Laos to get more fuel. I flew one mission uh, one day. The weather was bad, but uh, they wanted to drop bombs on a certain area. And I had a 16 flight, 16 ship flight that was leading. And we were all straight and level. Everybody was tucked in. And we dropped uh, what they call sky spot. They had radar sights set around, set around and they could triangulate the position they wanted to drop the bombs on and they would fly you in to a release point they had it all figured out and they'd tell you when to release the bombs so 16 ships would come in it's almost like a b-52 but we didn't have that many bombs and when you get to a certain point you just hit the, the button pickle button and all the bombs would go that's the biggest ship the biggest flight I ever led was 16 ships and that was only for a short while once everybody dropped the bombs the two flights four, one went one way and went to the other and went to recover and then we came behind them. What kind of interaction did you have with any of the ground troops, radio or just in person or did you have much while you're over there? The only really contact we had with I guess ground troops would be if the forward air controller came back, came down and uh, spent some time in our station. He, he was out in the field with the ground troops. Usually his airplane was at some little site that had a dirt strip, and he would he would be living he lived with the, the with the army the, the guys on the ground. That's about the only time we'd have contact with them, unless we talked to them on the radio or something. You know, they want you to come in. Mainly, mainly our radio contact was with the fact when we were over the target. Is there a lot of adrenaline going on a mission? I mean, when you scramble to go, just walk me through that as a alarm go off and you run out you normally it's not like uh, you've seen movies I guess where the klaxon goes off that's normally they try to give you a little warning they know about when you know when they want you to, to get airborne and they'll call you up and says hey uh, we will need you to get airborne in such and such a time but if it's a hurry up scramble yeah they would pick up the phone and it says go right now they wouldn't give you you know any warning if they if they could, they would. If they didn't have to, you would still get off the ground. And you, the ground crew and everybody was ready to go. The only thing you had to do, in fact, you, you, uh, while you were in the, the alert shack that we had there, you kept your gear on. I had a survival vest and my G-suit. And it was sort of unzipped, it wasn't tight. But I could zip that as I was go riding to the, to the airplane. Or running, running. When I get to the airplane before I go up the ladder, I would zip it up and zip up everything, and because the airplane was already pre-flighted, all the switches were set. All I had to do was get in, hit the start, hit the battery, hit the starter switch, and then we were gone. Mm -hmm. And then we had to taxi out to the end of the runway, and they had to pull the pins off of the the bombs and everything, and charge the guns, and then we were airborne. And usually we could do that in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's not like you see back here. I was in Air Defense Command here in the States, and we had to get airborne in five minutes. Mm -hmm. And if that time when I was young and full of energy, you could make it in about two and a half to three, three minutes. You could be air rolling from the end of the run, because you were sitting right at the end of the runway. And when the horn went off, you scrambled down, the uh, list of people were downstairs in our alert shack. And as they went out the door, they hit the button and the doors went up. And we got in, and I full alert in F-101Bs, which was a two-man airplane. And as I got in and strapped in, the RO was climbing up in the back. And I was hitting the switches starting the airplane as I was strapping in my parachute and the seat belt and everything. And as he was getting in, he was doing the same thing. As I was taxiing out, he was writing down where we had to go and our clearance and everything. And it was almost uh, close the canopy, add the power, make the turn, go to full power and you were airborne. So it, it didn't take long to go once you got, had, you know, you had practice at it and everything.
In fact, in the wintertime in, Alaska, in uh, Cape Cod, we had to put on a, what they call a poopy suit, a survival suit. And you could really get into that thing if you're, going, you're talking about the adrenaline flowing. And that would be sitting right there. We didn't stay in those because they were hot and sweaty. But you could get in one and get in the airplane and still get off within five minutes. You had to hustle. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. You fly on commercial planes anymore, like today? Is that? Uh, I will. I haven't. It's been a long time since I went on a commercial is flight. That right? Yeah. The last time I went uh, commercial, I was going. I went to a school in Texas when I worked for the Army here, Civil Service and the Aviation Division out at the airfield. The reason I asked was, you know, when you fly in a plane, to the average person that's kind of exciting or whatever, but just doing something like you did, it'd probably be boring you to fly on a jet. No, it's, it's not that boring. I know, you know, I can, I know what's going on a little probably more than the average person. I can tell when he's slowing down, when he drops a gear, drops the flaps, and uh, when he makes a sudden turn, I can figure maybe why, the, the air turbulence or something like that, or he, you know, he may have spilt his coffee in the cockpit. <laughs> But no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't flown a commercial. It must, must have been 15, 20 years now, I guess. But I will. I mean, if I had to, sure. I would. Yeah. yeah. My wife doesn't like to fly very much. That's why we don't fly much. We go. We drive. So. As far as Vietnam, I mean, you hear a lot of things. As far, uh, why, why do you think they refer to it as an unpopular war? Well, because I guess. The propaganda or whatever, I, I'd say the, well, I can't say the rowdy sure. kids back here in the States, they didn't, back then they had the draft. And I guess they figured, hey, this is not pertaining to the American, so forth. And uh, let the communists, I guess their attitude was let the communists take over the, you know, that part of the world at that time. They were trying to. Uh, I think that was the main reason, and it, it went on for so long, and the people that were getting killed, and the way it was run. If the president and his staff had kept their hands out of it, they could have ended it, or at least had a ceasefire in the 60s instead of in the 70s. If they'd have let turn the B-52s loose like they did in December 72, and bombed the passes up there where they were bringing the supplies down. On the Ho Chi Minh Trail, I think there were three or four main passes that they could get through the mountains up there. And uh, if they had to close those completely. In fact, uh, in the early war and so forth, the guys over there fighting it, they were wanting to drop tactical nuke weapons in there to close it completely. And that way there wouldn't have been that stuff coming down south. But as the powers to be, uh, they were picking targets up north, and that's why so many guys got shot down. They would pick the same target. They'd go in about the same route every day, same altitude, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it's just a pattern that they did. But if they would have, Johnson had kept his hands off of the war. The rules of engagement over there was very bad. I mean, you, if you, you know, busted the rules, you could figure your career was over. In fact, one of the guy, one of the colonel that, uh, when I first started instructing, he was, he had just come back from Korea, and uh, he was an instructor at the base I was at, and he went on up, he made good, he was the leader of the Thunderbirds for a while, and he was a wing commander over there in an F-105 outfit. You may have read some of his books, Jack Broughton is his name, and everybody called him Black Jack Broughton, but he briefed his troops, if they were fired upon up there, you know, coming off a of target and so forth, that they were clear to hit a target. Well, it was an incident where his troops were up there hitting the target, and then they came across half Ha Pong, and somebody opened up on them from one of the ships, and they shot back and they had it on gun camera film. Mm -hmm. And he he took the blame, he took the rap for it. The two pilots got you know letters of reprimand or whatever, but he got court-martialed, and in his career he re he retired. And things like that, you know, they were scared that the Chinese were coming in, the Russians were coming in. From what I can read and what I hear, they were over, they were there. It wasn't they were coming in. They were there. They were supplying all the weapons. They were teaching them how to do things, and that was it. So, just one of those things. If they, this one, the same way with Iraq now, you know, it's getting too much politics, and 
And if the first one uh, back in the 91, I guess the other president Bush, mm -hmm. they kept his hands off of the, the, that the generals run it. The only thing that I think he stepped in is when they got the, what, the Baghdad Basra Highway, they turned right instead of turning left. And if they had turned left, you know, they could have went on and did what they're supposed to be doing now or doing now and maybe it would have been over with. But it's just, it's just a shame that we're getting bogged down in something like this and it's a lot of politics in it. That's the way I looked at the Vietnam War also, it was a lot of politics. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, that's 58,000 names on the wall up there, you know, there was, it's just, it, a lot of them wouldn't have to have been there if they'd have let the war, let the guys run the war that wanted to run it. Okay. Well, what about the wall? Have you ever been up there? Yes. Every time I go there, I go, I go up there and I, I visit these guys. Do you remember the first time you went and how you felt? It's, uh, I don't know, it's, you get tears in your eyes and a lump in your throat because you know that, uh, well, this guy was shot down in 69. The other one, Joe Stein, was shot down in 66. And you think that they gave more than, uh, did more than I did, and I had a chance to come home my family have another career, or even up when I got out of the Air Force, to, I worked for the government down here 21 years. And it's just, it's just something, uh, I don't know, I guess at my old age I get touched. I, I get tear, I tear up when I hear the Star Spangled Banner. And especially uh, on Sunday when you're watching NASCAR races, when the flyby goes by, I mean, it's, I'm not ashamed to admit it, it's tears coming down the eyes. Just thinking about the guys on the wall, uh, you, you, you tear up. You get, you, you can't help it if you if you know the people on the. It's a lot of people on there, and I have a lot of friends on that wall. These particularly, because they were close, but I've got some others on there that I knew, other classmates too. How, how do you, if I can ask, you kind of described it, but as a Vietnam veteran, I mean, you say you get emotional, but what what's going through your? Maybe you've already told me what's going through your head and how you feel when you see those names. It's. It's a, it's a holy place for you guys, right? I mean, yes. Sacred, whatever. It's to me, it's a sacred place. It's just like, well, I'll make another reference here. The, in a military chapel, there's a pew reserved for POW MIAs. And this chapel down here is no different. But when I see someone, you know, they go in there and they take a hymn book and sit there. Or some lady comes in with a kid and lets her kid run up and down the pew. That touches me. And in fact, I've, I've seen it down here and I've told a chaplain about it, that that's sacred to me and it's supposed to be sacred and people should, you know, not do things like that and to observe the sacred. So, but that's, that's the way I feel about the POWMI, simply because I probably would, would still feel the same way if I hadn't lost some close friends. What significance does Vietnam have in your life as far as having been there you know, fighting for your country, does it mean much to you today anymore? I mean, Vietnam? Nothing more than uh, it's what I joined up for to fight for this country. I had to go where they won't told me to go. And that, I mean, I trained for many years and put in a lot of time and uh, a lot of scare time occasionally. That's what flying is, they say. I was and I was aboard them, interrupted by moments of stark terror. That's true, and, uh, but that's what I trained for. If I didn't want to go, I could have got out. I could have made it, a, didn't have to make it a career. I enjoyed it, I liked it, especially the flying. This is something I haven't heard of, but maybe there were enemy aircraft. Were there enemy planes or anything in the air? Not down south. All the MiGs were up north around Hanoi and Hapong. That's where the, all the action was, whether air-to-air -air combat and so forth. Occasionally, may, one may have would sneak across the border in Laos, but uh, you very rarely heard anything about that. Or maybe some helicopters that they had up there that would try to get in and support the troops or take supplies in. But there were no enemy aircraft south of the DMZ there, between North and South uh, Vietnam. They had uh, alert fighters on alert at Da Nang for that, and, it, and all the radar that they had on that thing, they could pick up when they got airborne up there and they could tell which way they were going if they were coming anywhere. They had that place boxed in with radar. And you flew that, was it F-100, did you say? F-100 fighter bomb. Is that the typical uh, aircraft that was called in on these, these strikes? I mean, or were there, I, I don't want, I'm thinking of A, there was an A something, maybe there wasn't. A-1. Is that 
Is there a one? That was the propeller driven one. It was a Navy. That was a sort of a World War, last of the World War II airplanes, I guess it came out, and it was, it used, it was used a lot in Korea. And they brought it back into the system during the Vietnam War simply because of its uh, capability of carrying a b large bomb load. It could stay over the target a long time. It was low, it was slow, it wasn't fast. But it could stay there quite a while and load over the target and it, 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 it could, I mean, it had a, a bomb load and a rocket load and everything else on it. And it was ideal for what it was suited for. Did you see the movie Forrest Gump? Yes. Remember that part where they called in the strike and then Tom Hanks drunk all his buddies out, the lieutenant? Was that napalm? Supposedly, you know, it looked like it burned. If it burned, if it if it blew and splashed, it was napalm. Well, I don't know about splash, but you see. I, 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 don't, I don't remember that really that part of the movie. I saw the movie, I've seen it a couple of times. A fireball of, of something was called in. <coughs> and actually, but I just was thinking about when you're talking, I had to visualize something. So. Yeah, if. If it's, well, even though when the bomb goes off, you're going to get a, a blast, a flash. But it's, if the napalm, if it's napalm, it's going to spread. It'll be over a wider, wider area than just a regular bomb. Yeah. Tell me just a little, again, some of these questions I know, but just for the sake of people that aren't going to know these things, but tell me a little bit about the enemy, who we were fighting in Vietnam. Well, we're fighting, I guess, the communists with the, the VC down south were mainly... They said, well, the people there in the South Vietnam that didn't want to be, I guess, liberated, live in a democracy. Most of those, I guess, they came down from the North when they separated the two countries. And I guess towards the, uh, the latter part of the war, after the, the 68 Tet Offensive, when they, uh, they almost, I guess, not completely annihilated the VC in the South, they were shipping North Vietnamese, regular North Vietnamese troops there to intermix with these guys. So that's my opinion of who we were fighting. We were still fighting the, the communists or the people of North who wanted to take over the, the South. And our reason for being there, North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam, kind of like, like, the, like in Korea? I don't think, no, they didn't do that right off the start. I think when we went in there, the North had, was backing these local VC units, Viet Cong units in the South, and they were attacking the local populace, trying to take over the country there. And uh, we went in, I guess the country asked for assistance or help, and we went in to take the place of the French. When the French pulled out, then these people started all this stuff with it down south. And instead of letting the south completely fall, I think that's why we went in there. <clears throat> I think Kennedy sent us in 60, what, 62 or 63. We started going and sending advisors in there. Have you seen a movie that maybe told Vietnam like it really was at all? Is there something, anything out there that you no, I haven't seen too many air movies. Maybe the, the, uh, the Flight of the Intruder was probably uh, the closest uh, air movie that I've seen about the Vietnam War. And that was, of course, that was a Navy uh, plane that went in up north. And they showed, uh, I guess, it was some actual combat films of, of people up there dropping bombs and everything. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of probably some of the gun camera film that uh, the guys that were shooting down the MiGs had. There's a program that comes on occasionally called Dogfight that, uh, that goes through and kind of explains it in detail to everybody what, what happened, what they did, and so forth. But uh, strictly in the air, uh, there are not that many. In fact, I don't, I can't, other than the Flight of the Intruder is the only one I can think of that, about the air war in Vietnam. Now, the others on the ground, uh, of course, you've got uh, Hamburger Hill and uh, what come, comes to mind like that. And then uh, I can't recall the others, but I, I've seen a couple, two or three, a, Apocalypse Now, that's another one, you know, that showed stuff going on on the ground, things like that. Did you have any type of interaction with the Huey helicopters or any of the helicopters? Not really. Uh, we were at Tuiwa. There was a Army uh, medical unit just south that was attached to us, and they flew the medevac helicopters, the dust offs, and uh, that's the only contact we had with them. Uh, maybe at the bar at night, they would come up to our bar and uh, drink or something like that.
but you, they would fly up and down the beach all the time and you knew what they were doing. You hear stuff again about Vietnam and I'm, I'm assuming in an aviation unit it wasn't as prevalent, but what about any drug usage in Vietnam? Was that something that was there, you think? It probably was, but I don't think it was much in the Air Force as it was in the Army. The guys in the Air Force, they didn't live out in the jungle, they didn't sleep in the mud. They had tents. I had an air-conditioned trailer. Uh, most of the uh, listed, they slept in the barracks. It was air-conditioned. They had three good meals a day, you know, hot meals. You didn't have to eat sea rations or whatever. They, they feed you in the woods or scrounge. Uh, you could take a shower every night, put on clean clothes if you wanted to. <clears throat> so I don't really, th probably was there some of them, like in every unit, there could be one or two. But I think at that time, in the Air Force, it wasn't a big problem. I never, when I was in, I never heard of it, actually, to tell you the truth, of anybody in the Air Force, uh, you know, dr uh, taking drugs, smoking pot, or anything like that. Are there sights, sounds, or smells today that remind you <coughs> of Vietnam? No, not over here. I didn't go off base too much over there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but the only smell I could get, I guess, is when I went out to the runway control and pulled runway control officer at night, uh, mobile control officer, and uh, you could get some of the smells, I guess, of the, the, the vegetation around uh, the, 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 the water, the swamps, and so forth. <clears throat> But being on the coast like that, we had a nice ocean breeze, you know, so it kind of blew it back up in the hills. <laughs> sure. As a Vietnam veteran, Jim, and as an American citizen, what does freedom mean to you, or what is freedom to you? Freedom to me? That's what we got here. I mean, if I want to go out and protest the Iraq war, I can do it. I mean, if I do it peacefully, I'll be all right. Of course, if I do it not peacefully, I'm gonna, I can expect to be thrown in jail or something. But to me, it's... It's the American way. I mean, it's, it's just the freedom part of it. And I'm proud I served. I, I did what I could. I didn't want to go, tell you the truth, like a lot of guys. But I went. It was my duty and my job. And if I'd have been, say, 10 years younger <clears throat> and didn't have a wife and two kids back home, I'd have probably extended and flew more missions. The flying was good, except that, like I told you, five minutes over the target each day. And a, the camaraderie, camaraderie was, was good too. I mean, you, you go to the club at night and you, you know, you guys that you've flown on your wing and uh, you've flown on their wing, you trust them. You have a drink with them and that's two or three or whatever and they look out for you. That's, that's sort of the, I guess, the Air Force fighter pilot attitude. You look after your buddy and you take care of things. But that's, it's a freedom. That's the way I think of it, look at it, uh, why we fought the Vietnam War, is trying to get other people to have the same freedom that we have. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? The American flag? Just what you said, freedom. I fly the American flag every day. I put it up and take it down. And I've done that since I came home. In fact, I've got an eight-year-old grandson now that he's been helping me take the flag down and helping me fold it since about four or five since he could hold it. And I'm proud of that, that he respects the flag. A lot of people don't respect the flag. They don't fly it right, they don't respect it. Did you receive any type of homecoming when you came home from Vietnam? My homecoming, when we came back in 68, 69, and just all the troops coming over there, was sort of a bad reception. <clears throat> when I hit Frisco, got off of the Mac airplane when I came home, I changed into civilian clothes. In fact, the word was around with the troops. It wasn't official, but the word was around, don't travel in your uniform, which is, to me, shameful. I mean, I'm laying my life on the line and I can't wear my uniform, which I'm proud of, home on an airplane. So I changed clothes and I came home. My wife, I came home a few days early than when I was supposed to. <clears throat> my wife and kids met me in Dulles, and that was my homecoming. My parents and her parents, at that time, they both had a, uh, a cottage on the James River, and they were at the James, down the, the, that river for that weekend. And something that told my wife that uh, she knew I was trying to get home early, and she, I hadn't told her that I was out of country yet. 
And uh, the 4th of July, I called her from Okinawa. I had been out of the country for a couple of days trying to get a ride home. I came out uh, sort of space A. I didn't go down through Thompson Newton and get scheduled on a regular flight since they told me I could leave early. And when I got to Okinawa, I got stuck. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing, uh, being in the Air Force, you wear the same uniform, you fly. You try to get a flight on a military aircraft that's coming back home, you know. And if they're carrying a certain cargo, they won't put you on it as a passenger. I had an R&R &R into Japan, I was trying to get back, and there was a whole bunch of troops there trying to get back to Space A. And every flight that come in, or you go talk to them, it says, and they can't do that, you're carrying ammunition. And I try to tell this guy, I says, hey, I said, I tote ammunition every day, man. Put me on the airplane and get me home, I'm, I'm running out of leave time. And you got troops here waiting for it. I says, can't do it. So finally I hit a pilot that was going out, and I says, say, uh, it says, uh, I'm trying to get back to Vietnam. I'm running out of leave. I'm, in fact, I'm AWOL. I'm a day late. And I said, you got a bunch of troops here that need to get back too. And the dispatcher is saying, we can't go on your airplane because you're carrying ammunition. He says, I'm not carrying ammunition. He says, I'll go and talk to this guy. He said, you grind up with other troops. He said, we'll get you home. But that's not <laughs> the point. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yeah, I'm proud of my service. I'm not ashamed of what I did. I mean, uh, I probably killed some people over there, not face to face, but I dropped bombs on them. I got uh, bomb damage assessment ports every once in a while that uh, the ground troops go in and they find, they call it KBAs. <clears throat> They'd come back and say, you got five or six or one or two or something like this. Those guys are trying to kill us. And it's just, uh, I know, a fact of war. You, you fight a war, you fight to win. And you don't go in there, you know, play patty, patty cake with somebody. He's going to kill you or you're going to kill him. No, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my service. In fact, I would have stayed in a little longer if I could have. <laughs> but I was a 20-year reserve officer. And at the time, uh, <clears throat> the saying was, uh, they tell you when you get 20 years as a reserve officer, they say the Christmas season is over, all the Christmas help can go home. So... <laughs> <clears throat> That's a little joke, though, but uh, I had a good job. Uh, my last three years, when I came back from Vietnam, I was a uh, flight test pilot at a civilian overhaul facility. And they, were, they would overhaul uh, F-101s, all the F-101s that was in the inventory at the time. They'd get about 100 airplanes a year. And they would take them apart, paint them, repaint them, put them back together, correct any corrosion and stuff like that, new modifications. And I would test fly them, just make sure that they work right. And uh, that's, that, you couldn't ask for better flying than that. And, and I would have stayed because I had, once I'd got into this organization, they had uh, places like this. They had one in Thailand uh, and Formosa. They had one in, uh, in Spain. And uh, Hill Air Force Base at Utah was sort of like the headquarters. And they're all good spots. And you know, you could, you could once you got in with, into them, you know, you could probably work your way around to the other. But, uh, Part of the Christmas help, I came home. I have no, no regrets on that either. I, I like to have stayed, I like to fly. But I came home and it gave me time to sort of get another career. I spent 21 years of civil service here. And the best part of that was uh, I came back, uh, bummed around for a year or two, uh, highway inspector on the side of the road checking uh, blacktop when they come in with a temperature gauge, you know, make sure it's the right temperature. And finally got a job as a flight scheduler dispatcher at the uh, Fort Lee Aviation Division at the airfield. They flew helicopters in. And when I walked in for the interview and the two young captains there looked at my credentials and saw how much flying time I had and what I'd done in the Air Force, they said, we ain't going to interview nobody else. You got the job. So I, I got the job there and uh, stayed there until they closed up in 88. This was in 74 when I went to work for them. And I worked that into an aviation safety position because yeah. their aviation safety officer would come in and stay two, two years, maybe three, and then he would go somewhere else. And I finally convinced the guy uh, that, hey, why don't you make me the aviation safety officer? I've had previous experience, send me to school, and I'll be here as long as the unit's here. You don't have to s swap around all the time. He said, that's a good idea. So they sent me to school, and I became the aviation safety officer there. Then when the unit folded up, they transferred me on post as a safety technician. But they taught me to fly the helicopter right there, too, which was funny when I first started. 
flies the same once you get it in the air, but getting it off the ground is an entirely different bird. <laughs> and people thank you for your service in Vietnam? Some people have. Now they're doing it more than anything. <clears throat> when you see some guy around that uh, knows you're from Vietnam, he'll shake your hand when you say, you introduce you. Uh, small story about that now. <clears throat> My wife worked uh, part-time at Fort Lee at uh, putting up car greeting cards. She met a lady whose son was a colonel, full colonel at Langley, an F-15s. He was a wing commander down there. Uh, academy graduate. But when Desert Shield, Desert Storm went, he was, he led his wing over. And my wife and her got to talking quite a bit. So when he came back, when the war was over, we went down, you know, to welcome him back and everything. And just so happens that we ran into his mom there in, on the ramp. And uh, she says, stick around after the ceremony. I want you to introduce you to my son. And I said, I'll be glad to. And so after all the speeches were made and everything, we walked up to the little stand and everything. And uh, she says, uh, told her son over and uh, says, uh, this is the guy I was telling you about. And he reached out and he says, you didn't, sorry, you didn't get one of these when you came back from Vietnam. Welcome home like they got. So that, that, that really feels good, you know. <clears throat> One more question. What, what, <coughs> excuse me. What, what should people remember about Vietnam? What should they remember? Mm -hmm. The sacrifices those 58,000 people made on that wall up there. And it could have been. It's a oh, It could have been over, maybe not that many names on the wall. I mean, it's, to me, those guys, they gave it all. I mean, I just gave a year, but they gave it all. Like you said, I go. I see that wall, and I, I go by, and I see the names of the guys I know. I've got tracings of them. You know, I'm going to move into the new house now. I'm going to make me a, a, a wall, my memorial wall, and I'm going to put these in the, the frame and stick it on the wall with this. And uh, just going up there and walking there and that thing and looking at it, it touches. Even talking about it touches sometimes. I'm going to go up there next month with some men that I've interviewed for the film and take them one at a time. And that's going to be the ending of the film, but which you are now a part of. So this is great. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I ask all the veterans from day one, four years ago, if it's okay from where you're seated. When I ask you, could you give me a salute into the camera? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, right into the camera, Jim. Great. Good, good.